at its most basic level. A car is a box that, by using levers and wheels, gets you to your destination. But we humans find personality and character in everything around us, especially our automotive pride and joy. The BMW 5 Series exudes a serious intent for owners who see that in their own character. The Ford Transit has the look of a no-nonsense truck ready for business. If Renault's customer research is to be believed, half the people who saw the thumbnail for this video thought the Twingo was hideous and should never have existed. If you're watching, then you're either curious as to why anyone thought this car should exist, or like me, you're the one in four who thinks this is the happiest, smiliest and greatest car of the 1990s. And like the BMW 5 Series and Ford Transit, maybe it's our playful, carefree side that loves it so much. Whichever camp you're in, this is a fascinating tale that spans five decades. So join me and Renault's head designer and father of the Twingo, Patrick Lequemont, as we delve into the Renault Twingo story. Renault was government owned in the 1980s, but in 1986, as they prepared to be privatised, their president, Georges Bess, was murdered by a terrorist group. The French government needed someone to continue his work to turn Renault's finances around, so turned to industrialist Raymond Lévy. Lévy didn't have a background in car production, he'd come from the oil industry, and this allowed him to take a fresh perspective on the 87-year-old company. His first goal was an increase in quality, made crystal clear when his Renault 25 company car had to spend a month in the shop. He cut costs, starting by ending North American sales by selling American Motors to Chrysler. Back home, he wanted to shake up the design department that had been producing rather uninspiring three-box designs. And with the current designer, Gaston Juchet, retiring, Lovey went looking for a new head of design, someone who could inject some life into Renault's lineup. Patrick Lequemont had worked for Ford, famously designing the Sierra as well as Volkswagen, but he'd always been looking for his dream job, design lead at Renault. After an interview with Raymond Levy, he was offered the job, but he had some very particular requirements before he was hired. Patrick's been very kind to sit down for an interview, so I'll let him explain just what he wanted. I, I, I accepted that I was going to have a much lower salary, but what I did not accept was to continue that design answer to engineering. I said it has to answer to the head of R&D, and this is exactly what happened. But the thing is that when I left his, his um, home, he had given me an assignment. He had uh, said, you know, given me carte blanche to, to do whatever I did, you know, accepted anything that I did, as long as it was good for the company. Renault's small car lineup was looking long in the tooth. The Renault 5's innovative shape hadn't had much of an update since 1972, and Renault's other budget model, the Renault 4, was over 25 years old. Renault's replacement for both cars, the Clio, would launch in 1990, but maybe there was a market for something smaller, a cheap and cheerful city car. Renault had already been working on such a car. The W60 concept had been thought up in 1986 and looked like a mini Renault Espace, a one-box design that could be a cheap entry-level model to replace the Renault 4. But it had been rejected by Renault's management and had been banished to a dusty Parisian lockup until Patrick Lequemont joined the company. Before leaving, the, uh, the head of design, a, name, a fellow named Gaston Juchet, he uh, gave me these two keys and he said, um, these are in fact uh, keys of garages where we have uh, uh, placed a couple of models of a rather interesting project, but which was not uh, approved. Uh, it was canned uh, because we weren't able to make uh, any money. So I, I, as soon as um, Gaston Juchet uh, left on retirement, I, I had the two models uh, brought uh, brought into the design center, and uh, there was a not so interesting uh, model which was uh, designed by um, Gandini, Marcello Gandini. It was a, a one-box uh, vehicle, um, and 
apart from the Gandini, there was this rather intriguing uh, little car. I, I looked at that little uh, little car and I thought, wow, that really has potential, despite the fact that it had a, a rather, I'm not sure about ugly face, but lifeless uh, face. Um, uh, but apart from that, I thought the car was rather interesting. The Quemont had been hired to shake things up at Renault, so after just a month on the job, he asked his manager to pitch it to the Renault president, who agreed he could put a small team together to explore this red concept penned by a young Jean-Pierre Pluet, now chief designer at Stellantis, the behemoth that owns the Peugeot, Citroën, Vauxhall, Opel, Fiat and Chrysler brands. This project was an ideal opportunity to create a new Renault design, something that showed even an entry-level car can be imbued with form as well as function. Just because a car is inexpensive doesn't mean it has to look and feel cheap. A new frame of mind was needed from the design team. And I, I often uh, you know, had talks with the whole of the design center, um, you know, I hate to use the word pep talks, but we, we did do a lot of discussion. We had a lot of discussions and uh, we, we all came up with uh, what was, uh, was, was termed the, the philosoph la, la philosophie du design, or no, you know, the philosophy of Renault design. And so we, we did, um, you know, it was not a surprise where we were going because we had discussed it and everybody within the design department uh, agreed that, we should move. Uh, I had this sort of this phrase which said, um, uh, "An innovative design, whenever possible, a strong style in all cases." This was the the the, the introduction that I, I gave to our, our our team of designers. The project lead would be Yves Dubray, and under him, the original concept would grow to something just a little smaller than the Clio. But the problem remained: how to make a profit on this tiny car. Renault's president, Raymond Levy, told Yves Dubray he'd only finance it if it would be profitable. Engineering and design were united in the idea of a new, exciting Renault city car, and they resolved to cut production costs and time to market. By doing this, they brought the car to market for around half the cost it took Peugeot to develop the 206 a few years later. Like the larger Renault Espace, the one-box design meant the body could be a single piece, and it was the first time a small city car would be made this way. To maximize space for the occupants, the wheels were pushed to the corners. The track, that is how far apart the wheels are, was also increased. We made it a little bit bigger and it got to the point where I said, uh, we must uh, in increase the, the, the track, you know, uh, because uh, as always with many Renaults, you know, the, the wheels were set in um, qu quite a bit in and you sort of felt that, you know, you you would approach the wheel opening and you say, is anybody there, 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 there? The wheel was miles away. And then uh, they accepted, but then at the same time they said, but you know what, you know, uh, this is uh, awful because uh, the, the, the track is going to be uh, wider than the, the, the next coming uh, Clio. And I said to the guy, well, uh, it's not because we got it wrong on the Clio that we're going to do get it wrong on all cars. The car was being prepared for a go, no-go decision from management, but one part of the car just wasn't right. And then in a desperate move, as I was not getting any real satisfaction from the, uh, our designers in terms of changing the, 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 the face, I actually did a little drawing, which is something which I never do. Uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I felt that was wrong to do that, but it was a bit desperate. And I drew this, uh, this, this thing which looked like... Um, like a frog, really, basically, you know, which I thought was kind of appropriate. And, um, and so uh, we had uh, the, the car in the showroom covered up. The meeting took place in the, in the boardroom meeting. And really, the results were quite, you know, quite poor. And uh, everybody was very, uh, felt that the, the likelihood of us being able to continue with this project was very, very low. And then came the time to go and have a look at the model in the, um, in the showroom. Most people had, you know, glum uh, faces. And then I uncovered the, the car and the car smiled at the president and then the, the president smiled back. And I said to him, this is 
this is not a type of car that um, that you will uh, leave out in the street, you know, at, in the winter when it's raining or snowing. You take it under your arm and you go and place it in front of the chimney. Now, most of the people in the room thought that I was going to, uh, com I was committing suicide. You know? And um, in fact, Raymond Levy absolutely understood what I was referring to, that it was like, like a pet, in fact. Um, and so the program was not uh, approved, but it was not rejected. There was no money available for a new engine, but there didn't need to be. The new car was all about personality. So long as it had an engine that was reasonably fast and reasonably efficient, that was all customers really wanted. It got a lightly updated version of the Cleon Font engine, born in 1962 and used in everything from the Renault 4 to the Sporty Fuego. To bring the car in on budget, the interior was going to be sparse, but that didn't mean it had to be boring. Two interior designs were prepared and the team chose the one with a modern digital dashboard. This was far from the acres of touch panels you get in modern cars and was more akin to a 1980s alarm clock. The colourful interior featured rear seats that could slide forwards to increase the boot space or recline backwards if two sumo wrestlers wanted to take it on a weekend camping trip. This was turning into a masterclass of packaging and characterful design, a sort of modern Gallic Fiat 500. One area the team was able to upgrade the car on a budget was the windows. On basic cars, tinted windows were an option, but Renault went to the manufacturer and asked them for a special price if the car only came with tinted windows. By simplifying manufacturing to only one type of window, Renault could have premium glass for only a little bit extra. By the middle of 1989, the car was ready to be introduced to the buying public through customer surveys. This was the key point of the, of the project. Namely, uh, the results were presented at, um, not at a board level, but it was presented with the, all the heads of the various uh, areas, be it product planning or, or marketing and uh, engineering and so on. And the results were as follows. Uh, basically, I, I would say that 25% just absolutely loved the car. They loved it and they were so enthusiastic. I had hardly ever seen such uh, very strong numbers. 25% said, I like it, but I wouldn't want to be the first person in the street uh, owning one. And then the 50% just hated the vehicle. That's interesting because, you know, it's all this thing about, you know, half a bottle full or half uh, empty. Um, I only saw the 25% as I, I, as I explained to them uh, just after they told me we've never had such bad results. Uh, you know, 50, we've never had 50% re, uh, you know, reject. I said, yes, but have you ever had a 25% um, uh, appro or, you know, approval? People who love the car. What Patrick was saying was the Twingo was the car equivalent of jazz. Many people can't stand it, but there's a sizable minority who love it. Does this mean there isn't a market for jazz? Of course not. But jazz is exciting, it's spicy. The worst Renault could do was make the automotive equivalent of boring Muzak. With such a flamboyant design, the car needed a suitably flamboyant name. The team combined the names of three dances, the twist, the swing and the tango, to make Twingo. Well, that's Renault's official word on it. They could have combined just twist and tango and made the same word. The egalitarian Twingo would be available as only one model, with precious few options. Patrick Le Quemont turned his back on the standard colours of white and silver and instead went for four vibrant colours. One colour proved to be a little difficult to be approved. And uh, we, you know, we had these uh, different colours, uh, of which one was funny because uh, Raymond Lévy, uh, of course, was Jewish. And uh, uh, he didn't quite like the, uh, the purple uh, version because, of course, purple is, is the colour of grief. And uh, uh, so uh, he, he expressed, you know, can you change that color and so on. And I, I didn't want to change the color because I thought it was just perfectly, you know, perfect. And the whole of the color and trim were just really dedicated in that. And so we changed the name and I, I made a presentation to him 
and they were the, the cars. And I said, and this is our new Bleu Outremer, <laughs> which, which of course, the, we hadn't changed a thing. The color was exactly the same. We just changed the name. And there was a smile because, you know, he knew that I knew and so on. The Twingo was launched at the Paris Motor Show, where else, in September 1992. The Citroën and Peugeot stands were empty, while the Renault stand was swamped. A survey at the time estimated 20% of all visitors came just to see the Twingo. 30 years after Beatlemania, the Twingo in four colours was causing Twingo mania. One of the most uh, exciting things that I've done in my life was uh, going into to Paris just when the Twingo was launched, in you know, driving a Twingo, and you would you would get to a traffic light, and then people you know would lower the window and say, "What is that?" and so on. It was amazing, you know. I mean, I've had, I've had that with a Ferrari, but yeah, so what? But with a car, you know, like, like that, that's, that's something. The playful styling cues from the design department were clearly on view, from the aerial that grew out of a door mirror, the scooped vent on the bonnet, the vibrant fabric, a cloth sunroof reminiscent of the one found on the Renault 4, to oversized colour-coordinated buttons. The team designing it had wanted an adult-themed advertising campaign. No cutesy cartoons, this was meant to be a grown-up car for those young at heart. The marketing team didn't listen though, but when the car went on sale it didn't seem to matter. Sales were brisk, and at around the same price as an entry-level Fiesta or Corsa, this was style on a budget. As the marketing slogan said, it's up to you to invent the life that goes with it. Despite there being only one model, no power steering, electric windows, central locking, or even an intermittent wiper, on that one large wiper blade, sales were brisk. In two years, Renault had sold half a million. Two years later, they hit a million cars sold. Although the Twingo was sold throughout Europe, and eventually in South America through a Colombian factory, this was mainly a French phenomenon and there was never a right-hand drive option, denying a dose of joie de vivre to those who drove on the left side of the road. With Renault riding high in Formula One, powering both Williams and Benetton to championship victories, it's perhaps inevitable, although still confusing, that Renault slapped a Benetton logo on the back for a special edition model and created a rallying prototype, the 150 horsepower Twingo Coupe, it's not clear why this would appeal to customers who were eschewing hot hatches for this tiny 55 horsepower car, so it's perhaps not surprising that the Twingo Coupe never saw the racetrack. Despite customers apparently happy with the small engine, the 1960s Cleon Font engine was put out to pasture in 1996 to be replaced by a brand new D engine that was faster yet sipped less fuel. Renault also experimented with new gearboxes. A couple of years earlier, they'd introduced a semi-automatic that did away with the clutch pedal. This became the Twingo-Matic the same year the D engine appeared, a three-speed fully automatic gearbox. Renault started offering more options for this sparse car, very important for Renault's finances as the Twingo was a hit and customers were willing to pay more to bling out their new cars. But through the Phase 2 model in 1998, the Phase 3 in 2000, and the Phase 4 in 2004, you'd be hard-pressed to see much of a change from the outside. Inside, the funky dashboard would get an update, including the luxury of a glove box. The body was always a little flimsy, and with every update, Renault seemed to add more reinforcing to the chassis to keep up with increasingly stringent end-cap crash ratings. There were various special editions of the Twingo, but the most luxurious was the Initiale from 1999, with leather seats and a sliding glass panoramic sunroof. The engine would get a little bit more power with the 16-valve model in 2001, although a bunch of extra valves can only do so much on the 1.1-litre engine. But with the aid of a new 5-speed gearbox, the car got to 60 in 11 seconds and went on to over 100 miles an hour, if you dared. But speed was never really the point of the Twingo, it was all about reveling in the frivolity. 
By the time Renault had sold 2 million Twingos in 2002, thoughts were already turning to the car's second act. Patrick Lequemont's star was on the wane after the lacklustre reception to his two outlandish designs, the Aventime and the Velsatis. His detractors, who'd wanted him to wipe the smile off the original car, were on the rise, and they ultimately won out with the bland face of the Twingo 2 in 2007. It was, of course, available in both white and silver. Patrick Lequemont stepped down as head of Renault Design just two years later. The original Twingo ended production in Europe, but continued production in Colombia until 2012. In the end, Renault had sold a quite remarkable 2.6 million Twingos. It was a tough act to follow, but the new Twingo 2 was larger, using a shortened chassis from the almost 10-year-old Clio 2 to save costs. This allowed the new car to get a much higher crash safety rating than the old car, and handling was greatly improved, as were the brakes. This newly revised chassis formed the basis for the Renault Wind two-seater roadster. To help save costs on the new Twingo, production was moved from France to Slovenia. And for the first time, the steering wheel was swapped to the right side of the car, allowing more countries to get their hands on a Twingo. Along with the D engine from the original car, Renault offered a diesel, which were becoming increasingly popular in Europe. Inside, it was better equipped, and they included the sliding rear seat design from the original Twingo. So, on paper, this was a better car, but the playful styling touches had gone. The left side of the brain, the logical side, was satisfied, but what about the right creative side? A car that checked all the playful Twingo boxes arrived from Italy the year the Twingo 2 launched. The new Fiat 500 was about the same size, and Fiat had made a successful reinterpretation of the 1950s classic, giving it much more room inside that it had a right to have. The Fiat Panda was satisfying the city car demand for those who didn't like cutesy looks. Sales of the Twingo 2 initially grew to respectable levels, especially as city car sales were down from the 1990s, but they quickly dropped off. People hadn't taken the car to their hearts like the original. Renault had gained customers who'd been put off the Twingo's cute looks, but they lost more loyal Twingo owners for precisely the same reason. Twingo mania was over. Renault's abortive attempt to race the Twingo in 1995 was finally realised 15 years later with the Twingo RS, but the car saw limited action, at least in the major rallying series. Road-going RS versions would eventually get up to 133 horsepower, with a top speed of 125 miles an hour and a 0 to 60 time just under 9 seconds. Renault would also create Gordini Special Editions, reintroducing the motorsport brand to a new generation. A style update appeared in 2011, sporting a new look that would roll out to other cars in the Renault range, but in truth the Twingo 2 wasn't long for this world. Renault had done a deal with Smart to jointly develop a new platform they would use for the Twingo 3 that launched in 2014. Although designers said the shape was inspired by both the Renault 5 and the original Twingo, the last of the original Twingo design elements, the sliding rear door and scoop door handles, disappeared as the car became a five-door for the first time. The engine was moved to the rear, and Renault tried to make the case that having a large lump under the boot and no storage space up front actually made the car really practical. The engine had to be tiny to fit into that small space though. Renault plumped for a three-cylinder petrol engine with and without a turbo, giving significantly more power than the original 1960s derived engine the Twingo had used, along with respectable performance and fuel consumption. Sharing the platform with the Smart meant that although Renault had put some character into their new car, it wasn't a million miles away from its German sibling. Customers were moving away from the city car segment, and despite the Twingo being one of the top five city cars sold in Europe, an update in 2019 and an EV version in 2020, in 2021 Renault announced this would be the last version of the Twingo. It might have been possible to make a profit on a city car with a new chassis in the 1990s by cutting costs, but by the 2020s it just wasn't possible. Renault put their faith in customers buying the cut price Dacia Spring or the recycled styling of a Renault 5 reboot.
right right now, you know, uh, Renault is uh, looking into uh, producing a car which will be inspired by the R4. I fear it may be more of a more more of a just a, a few design cues which which are shared and and probably not the the the, the actual concept and the freshness and finding some new things. You know, my my feeling is that the future is ahead and and not in the rearview mirror. So. I have a great difficulty in, in any kind of design approach where you, you are designing uh, based upon uh, the styling, uh, superficial approach based on a car that existed uh, 50 years ago, whatever. The Fiat 500 and Panda City cars that customers rushed to in the 2000s are fine cars, but they were pastiches of old vehicles. The Twingo was something rare today, a modern, characterful design that didn't play on nostalgia to get customers flocking to the dealer's showroom. Patrick Lequemon's later designs, the Aventime and the Velsatis, would show lightning doesn't strike in the same place twice. Customers didn't warm to these striking upmarket vehicles. But Renault continues to take chances. Yves Dupré would again be called on for the outlandish Twizy EV in 2011. Let's hope that if the Twingo returns, it won't be something that mimics the original's froggy face, but the design, style and frivolity of the original. A big thank you to Patrick Lequemont for giving me some time to talk about the Twingo. There's also a link to the whole interview above and in the description. His book, which I have here, Design Between the Lines, has much more information about his time working at Renault, and if you want to purchase it, there's a link to it in the description, although he didn't pay me to promote this. This is just, um, it's an awesome book. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.